Okay, so I want to look down at uh, 2 Timothy 3, look down at verse number 1 of 2 Timothy 3. It says, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So again, I'm preaching on covetousness, and we're going to highlight that in this verse, because this is a big deal. Covetousness is a big sin, and it's a big problem in our country. Um, so that's what I want to look at tonight. Look at verse number um, look at verse number two, where it says, men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous. The first thing it says, where it says, men should be lovers of their own selves, covetous. That's the number, the first thing it lists here. Why? Because covetousness is extremely selfish. If you're a self-centered, egotistical person, there's a good chance you're covetous because it's listed and it's the first thing that comes up. And notice how it ties in to, um, look at the end of verse 4. It says, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. So it ties in right there. If you're covetous, you love pleasures, you're into all the things of this world and all the pleasures, and you're seeking the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, you're going to be a covetous person. That's going to be part of your life. And people get consumed by covetousness. Get, they get consumed by the desires of this world, all the carnal uh, desires that we have. But I want to show you that it's, it's not from God, and we need to really avoid it. And number one, turn if you would to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Go to Deuteronomy 5 if you would. Deuteronomy 5. The first thing is covetousness is a major sin. We all know this, but I think it kind of just goes in the back of our minds sometimes, okay? It's one of the Ten Commandments, but it's the tenth one. It's kind of the, the forgotten one, if you, if you will. You're there in Deuteronomy chapter 5. The Ten Commandments are listed twice. It's in Exodus 19, I believe it is, and then in Deuteronomy 5 as well. This is Moses giving the recap of the law, but he goes over it again, and I want to show you here in Deuteronomy 5.21, Look down at your Bible, if you would. It says, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife, neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. So notice how it says, Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife. And then it turns around and says, Neither shalt thou covet thy neighbor's house. So it's giving us, the Bible's giving us the definition of covetousness right here. It's giving us the definition where covetousness is desiring something that's your neighbor's. It's desiring something that's someone else's. It's desiring something that's not yours that you can't have because it's someone else's. You can't have your neighbor's wife. That's adultery. Okay? So it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's super, super clear in the Bible. And, and the basic definition that I'm going to keep coming back to during this sermon that I want you to remember is covetousness is desiring something that's your neighbor's, something that someone else owns, someone else has. Notice, notice the list, right? Go back, look at verse 21, Deuteronomy 5, 21. Neither shalt thou desire thy neighbor's wife. And I think it kind of starts in order of severity here. That's probably the worst thing. Then it says thy neighbor's house. This is a big one. Okay, you go over to your friend's house, you know, and you, you see their house. They have a 3,000 square foot house or whatever the case is, right? They've got an extra bedroom than, than us, right? It's very easy to covet these things. Covet thy neighbor's house, his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, his ox, or his ass, or anything that is thy neighbor's. Notice at the end, it just gives you this catch-all. It says anything that's your neighbor's. Anything that's your neighbor's. And again, covetousness is desiring something that's your neighbor's, something that's not yours, and something you can't have. You know, if you say, oh, brother, I really like your shirt this evening, you know, and you go out and where'd you get it? And then you go get the shirt, same shirt, because you like it. You know, that's not covetousness. Covetousness is saying, you know, I really like so-and-so's house. You know, you, someone has you over for dinner and you looking around their house and you go, mm, I really like to live here. You know, oh, I want this house. Why do they have it and not me? That's covetousness, right? And when you're focused on it, when you're desiring something that's your neighbor's, and it gives a lot of examples that says his field, or his manservant, or his maidservant, and I could go through a million examples. Desiring someone's house, desiring someone's car, that's another big one in our society. Desiring someone's clothes, or social status, desiring someone's career, or business, right? You say, oh, how come he makes so much money? How come he works in this job? You know, don't be covetous of that. Look at it and use it as a and say, oh, if I want to become like so-and-so, why don't I go out and get the training I need, or the skills I need, so that I can achieve those kind of things with God's, you know, Lord willing. Um, 
don't look at it and say, oh, why isn't it me? I want that and desire it wrongfully. Okay, turn if you would to 1 Timothy 6. 1 Timothy 6. I should have had you keep your, your place in 2 Timothy where we started. So the first thing, we just got to get the definition of covetousness down, that it's, it's desiring something that's your neighbor's, desiring something that's not yours, and it's something you can't have. You can't have your neighbor's wife. You can't have their house unless you steal it from them, right? You can't have these things. Again, it's not, it's not saying, oh, you know, I like your hat or whatever, and, and going and buying that, that thing. But it's something that's out of reach for you, that's off limits for you, but you want it anyway. You set your heart on it anyway. You desire it anyway. That's what makes it sinful. Okay, it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's a big deal. Look at 1 Timothy 6 in verse 10. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, that's usually where we stop reading, right? That's the most quoted part of this verse. But notice, it keeps going, and it says, Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So it's saying, the person that loves money, the person that's obsessed with making money, that person is a covetous person. And notice, it says, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You say, what? I thought having money was good. No, it's saying if you love money, if you're a covetous person, you are hurting yourself. You're inflicting pain on yourself. You're inflicting, you're, you're piercing yourself with many sorrows, the verse is saying. Why? Because you will never achieve all those things that you're desiring. And covetousness just plants, uh, uh, when it gets, takes root in your heart, it's a bad thing and it will destroy other areas of your life. You're literally sabotaging yourself if you're covetous. And, and it's going to make you miserable. But when was the last time you knew of some like billionaire or millionaire where they're just the happiest person? They're super content. No, they're always like getting into these new schemes or, you know, trading drugs or whatever because they're not content. They're not satisfied and they're covetous people and they love money and they're inflicted by all these s sorrows that they brought upon themselves by being covetousness, by being covetous. Um, the story of Achan is the perfect example of this, right? You remember Achan in the book of uh, Joshua? Achan, after uh, the conquest of Jericho, he sees a Babylonish garment and he covets that. He says, I saw it and I took it and then I hid it and he hid it in his tent. And what was the result of that? Well, the nation of Israel lost the next battle at Ai and then Achan and his whole family are killed. That's what covetousness will do to you. It might, not literally, but it will destroy you. The people, people in your, who you see who are super covetous people who love money and that's all they think about and that's all they're obsessed about, it destroys them, it, it consumes them. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, you don't have to turn there, it says, he that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase, this is also vanity. And that's a really, really good verse, right? If you love silver, you're not gonna be satisfied with it. If there's something in this world that you want to fill you up, if you want your self-identity and your self-worth to be based on your net worth and based on all the things you own and all the things you desire and covet, you're not going to be satisfied. You're never going to be satisfied. You're just going to pierce yourself through with many sorrows. That's what's going to happen. That's what's going to come from it. Um, and a little side note here, but we know coveting is one of the Ten Commandments. I've, I've explained the definition, right? It's desiring something that's your neighbor's, desiring something you can't have, okay? But tithing, if you don't tithe, you're implying, you're implying that you're a covetous person because you say, well, I'm more important than God. You're putting yourself before God if you don't tithe because you're saying, well, all the things, we all have things we got to spend money on, bills, you know, maybe there's a vacation you want to take, whatever. I'm not saying those things are bad, but it, they become bad when you suddenly say, well, God, I'm not going to give it back to you what you told me to give. You know, God gives us everything, and when we don't give back what's his, wants 10% back, he give, lets us keep 90, but when we give him that 10% and we say, well, I'm going to put this towards my new car that I want, that's a problem. God has a problem with that, okay? Um, turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter 6. Book of Jeremiah, one of the major prophets in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 6. So we've seen covetousness is a major sin. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Achan is a perfect example of why you don't want to be covetous because you will get caught and it will destroy your life, and not tithing is, is covetous. But I want to move on here to, to looking at, at Jeremiah 6, and I want to
talk about my second point here, which is uh, we live in a covetous nation. And this is a pretty broad, we could, we could say we live in a covetous world, to be honest, right? Um, it's not something that, that's specifically you know, focused in the United States, but it is, a, it is a problem. It's a problem in our society, and I want to talk about that. Look down at um, Jeremiah 6. Look at Jeremiah 6, 11. Jeremiah 6, verse 11 says, Therefore I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary with holding in. I will pour it out upon the children abroad and upon the assembly of young men together. For even the husband with the wife shall be taken, the aged with him that is full of days, and their houses shall be turned unto others with their fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand upon the inhabitants of the land, saith the Lord. Notice, for from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely, okay? That is a big verse. That directly applies to the United States. And especially that last part where it says, the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. Boy, do we have some covetous false, false teachers in this country today. Amen. Yeah, we have a lot. All these television, televangelists and, and mega church pastors driving around in, in their supercars and their private jets. That's what this verse is talking about. But notice what it says. It says, from the least of them, even unto the greatest of them, everyone is given to covetousness. It's saying the people are covetous. The nation as a whole is covetous. And this is the nation of Judah at their lowest point. This is the nation of Judah before they're taken into captivity, before they get off to Babylon. And through Jeremiah is saying everyone's covetous. They're all covetous. They're all looking after themselves. They're all desiring things for themselves. They're all covetous. Turn two chapters over to Jeremiah 8. We're going to see the same thing again in Jeremiah 8. And this is a major, this is a major problem in America. This is a major problem in the United States and in Western society as a whole. People are covetous. We live in a covetous society because it's based on all the things you want. It's capitalism. But look at Jeremiah 8.10. Uh, look at Jeremiah 8.10. It says, therefore will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall inherit them. Notice, for every one from the least, even unto the greatest, is given to covetous, covetousness. From the prophet, even unto the priest, every one dealeth falsely. So it says basically the same thing as Jeremiah 6. And it's saying everyone is given to covetousness. Everyone. The whole nation. Um, and I want to read for you 2 Peter 2 now. You don't have to turn there. 2 Peter 2, 3 says, and through covetousness... Actually, turn there if you would. Turn to 2 Peter 2. This is a really good verse. I want you to see this. Um, this is talking about false prophets in 2 Peter 2. And it's talking about them making merchandise of you. Okay, look at, uh, look at, 2, Peter, look at 2 Peter 2 in verse number 1. It says, but there were false prophets among the people. This is just for context. It's talking about false prophets. Even as there shall be false teachers among you who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that, brought, that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Notice verse 3, it says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you, who judge, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. That's what I want you to look at. Look at verse 3. It says, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. So it's saying through covetousness, they're going to make merchandise of you. How? Through their feigned words, through their lying words, their deceitful words, their malicious words. This is talking about false prophets, though. But this, I think this can be applied uh, you know, very broadly that, that you know, through covetousness, it's saying the false prophet is covetous. All these false teachers, these, these televangelists, these mega church pastors, they're covetous. They want your money. And they're going to tell you the words you want. They're going to deceive you with their words, and they're going to make merchandise of you. But I kind of read it another way, too, where it says, and through covetousness, through your covetousness, you're, if you're covetous, you will be deceived by their feign words, and they will make merchandise of you. And people do this all the time, right? All the internet scams and all of this stuff. If you're covetous and you desire something that you shouldn't be desiring, that's a wrong desire, and there's an avenue for you to get that, someone can make merchandise of you. And all throughout society today, we see people who, through their own lust, through their own covetousness, people are deceiving them and making merchandise of them. And I don't want that to be you. 
okay? But you, you can be taken advantage of by, by the consumer society, the covetous society that we live in if you have these tendencies. Let me give you some statistics real quick um, about the advertising industry in this country, okay? So this is a major problem, like I've talked about, because our nation is covetous, the society as a whole, everyone is always looking for the next thing. They're always looking to buy the next thing, the next car, the next house, the bigger house, the better car, the next vacation, whatever it is. And the entire advertising industry is designed to make you covet things, whether you need them or not. You know, maybe there's a legitimate need for, that you have for a lawnmower and you just happen to get a lawnmower ad and you go buy that lawnmower. But that's super, super rare. In general, it's stuff you don't need, but they make you desire it. They make you covet it, especially things that you can't have that are maybe out of your financial reach or, you know, or things that are unattainable for you at that point, and they plant that seed of desire, that seed of covetousness in your mind. The US advertising industry accounts for roughly 37% of total advertising spending. This is 2023 data, by the way. 37%, we're not 37% We're not 37 of the global population, but we account, the United States accounts for 37% of global advertising spending. What does that mean? People want you to covet, they want you to buy stuff, and they spend, last year, $280 billion on advertising in this country. $280 billion, that's a lot of money. That's way more money than I have, or <laughs> probably any of us, but, the idea, the thing is, they're promoting this. They're promoting covetousness, they're promoting greed, they're promoting lust because they want you to covet, they want you to buy all their stuff that they're throwing on all these ads. And it's wicked. You shouldn't be coveting these things. And let me go off on another, another note here. Social media is another thing that feeds covetousness. Because you see someone, ah, oh, so-and-so posted, and they went on this beautiful vacation, you know, and their life looks so perfect, and their kids are so perfect, and their house is so beautiful, and all of this. And then you say, oh, man, I wish I had their life. No, that's covet. Don't go coveting their kids, you know, or their house, or whatever. That's weird. It, so, and not, that's separate from all the ads and all the other stuff you see on social media. Okay, but it's, it plants that desire in your mind where you say, oh, I really wish I had so-and-so's house. I really wish I had so-and-so's car or kids or dog or whatever you want to desire and covet through social media. And it gives you availability to look at anyone, anyone. And you're always going to find people who have more things, who have a higher social status, who have a bigger house or have a nicer car. And you can't let that infect your mind. Okay? If it's getting in your head, get rid of social media. If you're able to, to see everyone's posts and just be genuinely happy for them, great, okay? But don't let it be something where you just see something and someone else is succeeding or, or has some blessings in their life and you just go, oh, I wish that was me, you know? And you say, I want that. That's covetousness. And don't go comparing yourself to other people like that. Amen. It's never helpful, it's never helpful. Um, turn, if you would, to Proverbs 28. Book of Proverbs chapter 28. Okay, so we live in a covetous nation. Face it, we live in a covetous nation. Everyone's out there to take your money. Everyone's out there through the ads and the marketing and everything. They're out to make you covet. They're out to make you desire. The Bible says just be content. I'm gonna get to some verses on that later. That's the real answer here. Just be happy with what you've got. And all you need to do is take a trip to a different country or look at what other people in this country or, or, or in the world have and you realize, wow, we're really blessed here. We're really blessed. It doesn't matter what your state is. You don't have a car? Well, like half the world doesn't have a car, okay? If you have anything, be thankful for it, okay? And the third reason, the, the third point I've got is you need to hate covetousness. You need to hate it. We know it's a major sin. We know we live in a society that's given to covetousness that wants you to have these desires so that they can make merchandise of you, so they can sell things to you. But you need to hate covetousness. Look at Proverbs 28, 16. Proverbs 28, verse 16 says, the prince that wanteth understanding is also a great oppressor, but he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. Notice that. That's a great promise right there. It says, he that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. Okay, that's what you want. You don't want the promise that we had back in 1 Timothy 6 where it says, the love of money is the root of all evil, and if you covet after that, you're piercing yourself through with many sorrows. You don't want that promise. You want this one that says, if you hate covetousness, you'll prolong your days. Why? Because God wants you to be content. 
and you need to hate covetousness. We should hate every false way. We should hate all the sin and the perversion and all the wicked things going on in our society, but you need to hate covetousness because it's going to destroy your life. It's going to consume you. And look at this beautiful promise, right? Who doesn't want to prolong their days? Who doesn't want to live long and be blessed by God? How do you do that? Hate covetousness. Okay, turn if you would to Exodus 18, Exodus chapter 18. Okay, so not only is it just God lays it out. That's pretty easy to see, right? He that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. God wants you to hate it. It's not a good thing. All the desires that this world tries to push on you. Oh, you got to go to college and you got to, you know, buy this big old house and you got to do all these things. Have a new car. You know, what's the deal with having a new car? Like, having a new car is great, but what? old cars last for so long now. There's no problem with, with having an old car. Uh, don't know why I just thought of that. But it's so clear. God wants you to hate covetousness. He wants you to be content and if you don't hate covetousness, if you let this creep into your life and you become a covetous person, it is going to severely hamper your Christian life. It is going to severely inhibit your ability to serve God. This is the first, the, the first point, uh, or the first, the first thing here in Exodus 18. It says, look at Exodus 18, verse 19. It says, Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God, and thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way wherein they must walk and the work that they must do. So this is Jethro. This is Moses' father-in-law when they're in the wilderness. And Moses was, had a system where if the people had a problem or they, you know, they had a uh, d disagreement, they would bring it to him, and Moses would judge for the people. But it wasn't working because they would line up all day and Moses wouldn't get to everyone. So Jethro is saying, hey, let me give you some advice. You have to appoint men. You have to appoint leaders over the congregation to do this work with you, to judge, to, to judge all the cases of the people. Uh, let's keep reading there. Uh, let's keep reading. It says, Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear God, men of truth, notice, hating covetousness, and place such over them to be rulers over thousands and rulers over hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of tens. So it's saying, Jethro is, is giving Moses this advice. He's saying, you want to find men that, number one, fear God, number two, that are men of truth. And what goes right along with those two things are men that hate covetousness. And this is especially important in, in this role in particular because it's the role of a judge, right? You don't want people giving bribes to the judge and say, hey, decide this case in favor of me and I'll pay you. So that's, that's especially true in this case. But this is, goes for any leadership position. Any leadership position, you need to hate covetousness. And you can't be a leader if you're covetousness, if you're covetous. You can't be a leader in, in the Old Testament nation of Israel if you're covetous. And this is definitely something that you don't want to be today. Um, go, if you would, to um, 1 Timothy 3. 1 Timothy 3, this is the, the obvious one that you probably all, third, all thought of when I said this. Um, but a, a pastor can't be covetous. A pastor can't be covetous, right? This is in the qualifications for a pastor. This is where we're turning is 1 Timothy 3. This is super clear um, and very applicable. It's New Testament. It says in 1 Timothy 3, uh, look at verse 2. 1 Timothy 3, 2 says, A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre. We'll come back to that. But patient, not a brawler. Notice, not covetous. You can't have a pastor, you can't have a preacher who's covetous. Why? Because they're going to be out for your money, and they're not going to be preaching the things that you know, God actually wants them to preach. They're not going to preach the whole counsel of God because they're going to have itching ears to hear what you want to hear so that they can bring the most people in, you know, and they can you know, have the biggest offering. It's super important. You cannot be a covetous person and be a pastor. And notice, it ties it, it, it says it, God says it a second, a second way. It says, not greedy of filthy lucre. It, it tells you, you can't be greedy of money or anything else. Covetousness, just broad. You can't be either. You can't love money and be a pastor, period. End of story. Go to 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. This is the other big one. If you're covetous, if you're a covetous person, it will get you kicked out of church. It will get you kicked out of church. This is not a popular or preached opinion today, okay? But it's in 
uh, you know, the same list of, of sins that we see here in 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 5.11 says, But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat. Okay? The biggest one is fornication. That's, it's at the top. But what's second? Covetousness. Covetousness. Okay? And again, what's the definition of covetousness? It's where you're desiring something that's your neighbor's, when you're desiring something not yours that you can't have, okay? Loving money, all of this stuff. If you're a covetous person, the Bible says you should be kicked out of church. Why? Because a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. If you're over here trying to promote some Ponzi scheme because you're in love with money and you're trying to make as much money as possible off your fellow church members, you're going to get caught and you're going to get kicked out. You know, that's just the, the, the fact of the matter. And, you know, it might not be as obvious a sin as fornication or drunkenness, you know, or idolatry, okay? But it's just as serious. It's just as serious. It's one of the Ten Commandments. It'll get you kicked out of church. You can't be a pastor. You can't be a leader if you're covetous. If you're covetous. It will destroy your Christian life. And obviously, it has to be an ongoing issue. At this list of sins, it's not like, well... You are a fornicator in the past. You can't come to church. It's the same thing with covetousness. It's not like, oh, you know, you were covetous in the past or you struggled with that in the past. You can't come to church. It's not talking about in the past. It's talking about right now, if this is an ongoing problem, right now. If you're living in fornication right now, if you're a drunkard right now, if you're covetous right now, that's how these verses apply. Obviously, we're not talking about, you know, 20 years ago or, or whatever your past is. Um, but it's a major problem. It's a major sin. And it'll get you kicked out of church. Do you think God cares about it? Do you think God wants us to hate it? It's, remember, Proverbs 28, where we read, it says, He that hateth covetousness shall prolong his days. God needs you to hate covetousness. You cannot be an effective Christian if you're tied up with all the things of this world. If you're just focused, and I know I've harped on this before, if you're covetous and you have your heart set on something that's not right, that God doesn't want you to have, that's off limits to you, and you go pursuing that, it's going to wreck your Christian life because you have the wrong desires. Turn if you would to Luke 12. Luke chapter 12. Jesus gives us a really great warning about this in Luke 12. And this is one of my favorite, favorite verses probably in the New Testament is, is Luke 12, 15, where it says, I'll have to wait for you to get there. Luke 12, 15 says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. Super powerful verse. Jesus is saying, beware of covetousness. Why? For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. I love that second part of that verse. What's it saying? It's saying your life is not defined by all the earthly possessions you have. Your life doesn't consist of all the things you own. All your earthly possessions, none of that matters. Jesus is saying, beware of covetousness. Because if you desire the things of this world, if you're constantly focused and seeking after the carnal things of this world, the things that pass away, you know, if you're constantly seeking after possessions, that's not what life is about. That's not what your life consists of. That's why he says, take heed of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses, okay? And we as Americans, we as, as you know, living in, in the world and the society that we live in, we have a lot of possessions. We own a lot of things. That's not what your life is about. That's not what your, your, the focus is. That's not what's important. Earthly possessions don't matter to God. It doesn't matter how big your house is. It doesn't matter what you own. And you shouldn't seek those things as the focus of your life. The focus of your life should be eternal things. It should be the kingdom of heaven. It should be raising your family for God. It should be things that have eternal value. Not carnal things, not possessions, not earthly things that pass away. Turn, if you would, to Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. Right? So the, the abundance of the things which we possess, that's not what our life consists of. That's not where our focus should be. It shouldn't be on a house or on a car or on a career or anything like that. Look at Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13 and verse 5. Hebrews 13, 5 says, 
Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Okay, so I want to tackle the first part of this verse first. It says, let your conversation be without covetousness. So it's saying, don't be covetous. But it's saying your conversation. So obviously the first application is don't just have a bunch of covetous stuff come out of your mouth. Like, oh man, I really want that car. You know, and just constantly be talking about that. You know, the, the Bible says, right, the, the, uh, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. People are going to know if you're covetous. If you're constantly talking about money, if you're constantly, if every sentence you talk about the stock market and what your 401k is doing, okay, let it go. That's not what life is about. But then, in, and then it says, and be content with such things as ye have. This is the opposite of covetousness. Covetousness is desiring things you can't have, desiring things that are your neighbors, desiring things that are off limits to you. Contentment, godly contentment, is being happy with what you've got, being thankful for what you've got, thanking God for the things he's given you, for the blessings he's given you. And you say, well, I'm not as well off as so-and-so. I don't have as big a house as so-and-so. It doesn't matter. Thank him for what you've got. We've all got something to be thankful for. Notice what it says. Let's keep reading. It says, and be content with such things as you have. Notice why? It says for. God's saying, because he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. What is that verse saying? That's talking about eternal security. That's talking about salvation. It's saying, be content with such things as you have. Why? Because you're saved. Amen? If you're saved, you can be content. You can be happy. You're not going to go to hell when you die. That's pretty good. Okay? You, we can all be content. There's no excuse to not be content. This verse is saying, be content because Jesus saved us. Because we have eternal security. Because he'll never leave us nor forsake us. That's why we can be content. And what a beautiful picture, right? If you're saved tonight, if you're saved tonight, you can be content. You can be happy. Doesn't If your job's falling apart, if all the things of this world, if you're saved, you can have that contentment. You can have that peace of God knowing that your soul, your spirit is on its way to heaven when you die. Why? Because you trusted Jesus as your Savior. That's what it's saying. That's a beautiful verse. And just to wrap it up, I'm going to read you Philippians 4. Philippians 4.11. Actually, you can turn there. This is another famous verse. Philippians 4.11. So if you're saved tonight, don't be covetous. Be content. God tells you to hate covetousness. It's a major sin. It'll get you kicked out of church. I know we live in a covetous nation. I know we live in, you know, in a world that's just trying to shove stuff into your face, telling you to buy all this stuff, desire all this stuff. This is what your life has to look like, some perfect, what's the, the, the term is Instagrammable. You have to have some Instagrammable life, you know, where everything you can post and it's just perfect. That's not what life's about. God wants you to be content. And, and look what it says in Philippians 4. You've read these verses before, but let's read them again. Philippians 4.11 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. The beauty of this verse, what Paul is saying, he's saying, I've learned in whatsoever state I am to be content. He's saying, whether I get the promotion or I don't get the promotion, I'm content. You know, whether the stock market does great or it does terrible, I'm content. Whether I, you know, regardless of what's happening in his life, right? He says, whether I'm abased or I abound, you know, whether I'm full or I'm hungry, whether financial times are good or bad, whether your health is good or bad, whether your marriage is good or bad, Paul is saying, I've learned in whatever state I am to just be content. And that's what God wants from you. He doesn't want you, and I know we all have problems, but he doesn't want you to be focused on all the things of this world. He wants you to be content, and he wants you to hate covetousness because it's a major sin, it's a major problem in our society. But it's, it has major ramifications for your Christian life, okay? Who, who wants to be pierced through with many sorrows? Versus, if you hate covetousness, as Proverbs 28, 16 says, you'll prolong your days. That sounds a lot better to me. That sounds a lot better, okay? And so when you need to reject the culture of this world, reject the culture of society where it's just like, you have to be buying new things all the time, where Christmas is just some giant, like, 
trading fest where you're like, I got so-and-so this gift, but they didn't get me one that was equal value. People are silly, okay? But it's like, reject all that. Like, it, give genuine gifts from your heart. You know, God loveth a cheerful giver, but don't be covetous. Don't be desiring things that your neighbor has, that your brothers or sisters in Christ have, that your coworkers have. Don't be desiring those things and letting that consume your life because it's going to destroy your Christian life. It's going to hamper your work for God. Just be content. That's what the Bible says. So let's close in prayer.